Thank you very much for the introduction. Could I add a personal tribute of my own? Uh, I'm sure all of you have been delighted to have the organizational skills of Joy Tottenham helping to organize today. If I may say so, she's done so with fantastic hu humor and a degree of bravery. The title of this speech is enough to make you reach for a pillow, pull over some head covering, and have a good hour's sleep. You will be forgiven if you do so. I shall try to battle against those desires, particularly for those of you in the hot top area. And I'll try to persuade you of the risk to sport and of other recreational endeavors if good governance is not in place. I'm going to start with this summer, insofar as we had one. This summer has seen two sporting events which I want briefly to mention. First, it was a glorious summer for English cricket. The English cricket team beat India in a way which was dramatic. Not only did it do so in the first test, the team continued repeatedly to win, even achieving a, a historic innings and many runs victory. In athletics, individual competitors on behalf of Great Britain produced the, their crop of predicted medals. Each sport had its targets. In the case of England in cricket, it wanted to become <coughs> the best cricketing team in the world. And in the case of athletics, the individual athletes and teams wished to get to their target crops of medals and obviously achieved personal bests. Within the UK, we have grown as a sporting nation. In the 1970s, 1980s, and early 1990s, we were not thinking in those terms. We thought of ourselves as the gallant loser. Indeed, we began to promote the idea that coming second or last was a good thing because it was only taking part that actually mattered. By 1996, at the Atlanta Olympics, Great Britain was in a very sorry state. The Great Britain team was 36th in the medal table and only won one gold, eight silver and six bronze medals. Sports administrators had seen this failure coming. Whilst there is some dignity in losing uh, and being gallant about it, and we know that there is, uh, it is a good quality to be magnanimous in victory, no country likes to see a decline in sporting or recreational activity. It is literally not good for the state of health of the nation. No athlete likes to find that he or she regularly loses, and no team enjoys a thrashing. So far as history is concerned, it was not always thus. The Victorians appreciated the importance of the principles of good governance. I am not an apologist for empire. However, within the system of government as exported by Great Britain, if one looks at India, India was run with a central structure from London out of the Foreign Office through uh, a system of governorships exporting regional governors and courts and magistracy, magistracy as the umpires for disputes. I'm a lawyer. And the argument that many advance, insofar as there is good that came out of the empire, is that we exported a system of justice. We had what in sport you need, the independent tribunal, when uh, a charge is brought or something goes wrong. So whilst one would not condone the idea of empire, what I'm talking about is the concept of good governance, which the Victorians recognized. Lord Curzon ran India from Whitehall with fewer civil servants than we have in Whitehall in the Foreign Office today, I believe. No doubt um, an expert will correct me if I'm wrong. But undoubtedly, the size of the civil service was proportionately smaller for the task undertaken. In Victorian sport, 
we saw the emergence in 1863 of the Football Association, in 1880 of the Amateur Boxing Association, and all of you in your own activities will say, well, we, we are older, or we, uh, our own governing body, or our own rules emerged in that time. Move forward to 1966, that great victory which uh, we all remember, and we remember it even if we were too young to know about it at the time because our parents have told us all about it, the 1966 World Cup. It comprised a talented team, undoubtedly, a dogged team. It had, there was a small management structure around the English team and a manager held in huge respect by all of his players. What then went wrong in South Africa? in 2000 in the World Cup. I, I don't want to advance the thesis today that what went wrong in the World Cup in South Africa was a governance question. It, it, it's for you to ask and examine whether in fact governance within uh, English football played a part in the poor performance of the team in South Africa. If we return to the English cricket team for a moment, the question is, can we capture, can we identify now what made the English team a success this summer? I would use one word for the, uh, to describe the success, or to define what caused the success, and it's discipline. The management structure which provided support to the players was a disciplined, well-organized structure. There was a close working relationship between captain, coach, and management. And if one reads articles about the English team over this summer, one realizes that the relationship between uh, the captain and coach and management was a close, well-run working relationship. There was discipline within the management of the team. There was no slack between games. You may remember the last time we had a signal victory in cricket, the team were up drinking all night for 24 hours, unable to change before going on yet another victory tour the next day. You didn't see that in this test. The discipline extended between matches with no slack, either between tests and no let up in the delivery of quality performances by team, staff, support, extending in, for example, into hotel arrangements, uh, transport, <coughs> and so on. It appeared all to work like clockwork. One can contrast the uh, visiting team, in that there was a sense, though there were injuries of course, but there was a sense that the discipline within the team was not working as well as it should, certainly not for the, the, the world's then top team. How then against this very general background might we start to <coughs> move towards a definition of good governance in the context of sport and recreation? Here's my definition. Good governance in sport and recreation means that those responsible for the activity run it so that first, each individual or team is able to achieve his or her maximum potential. Second, the sport or activity is available for all who wish to participate in it. Third, both of these objectives are achieved at no more than reasonable and never excessive cost. And fourthly, these objectives are achieved with reasonable safety. That's my definition. You will note that in that general definition, I do not say that good governance comprises the separation of payment from audit activities, or having a child welfare officer, or that in a sport for children you should have a child protection officer, and so on. I'll come to those points later. We must be clear, though, that the whole objective of governance arrangements is to ensure that the sport or activity thrives with reasonable <coughs> safety at optimum and no greater than optimum cost. I doubt I need to persuade this audience of the need for good governance. But identifying how one might define it helps then set the priorities within any sport or, or uh, recreational activity for how one is going to set about the task of good governance. I shall come shortly to 
how we recognize good governance. But before doing so, I want to share with you my own experiences where I have encountered a breakdown in good governance and have witnessed the consequences of it. And it brings me to the Sport England Inquiry. In June 2009, I had a visit in chambers from the Chief Executive of Sport England and Sport <coughs> England solicitors. I knew little about the governance or organisation of sport at that time. I was told, and it's obvious from the report, that lottery money was brought into sport on a large scale in the mid to late 1990s. And it was explained to me that £20 million of that money, and some treasury money possibly, had gone out of lottery funds through something called the World Class Payments Bureau over a seven year period. Since the bank account of the World Class Payments Bureau had never been audited, and since it didn't crop up on reports, and there weren't board minutes to indicate the establishment of the Bureau, would I mind inquiring into this and reporting? And would I mind doing so within, I was asked, three months? It was the 17th of June that the quarry was announced, so I was asked to report by the end of September. I got the report out, I think, on the 4th of December, which, given that I had to spend the summer and read, I think, 25,000 documents and interview, I think, from recollection, about 20 witnesses. It was a heavy task. Until then, my own involvement in sport had been occasional participation in events. Uh, I sail. I had acted in cases, for example, where a rugby player had unwisely bitten the ear off of an opposing rugby player in a scrum in the early 1990s. Uh, or I had sat as chair of a tribunal when certain sportsmen and women had got a little over um, energetic outside the sporting arena on visits to Europe. So I was coming at the problem from a relatively cold start, although I knew from my own experiences, for example with sailing, uh, how a sport which seemed to me to be successful had been running. What did I find? that in 1996, the low ebb of sport in this country led to a number of people saying we must put money into sport in order to right the wrongs. And examples were given of what the Australians have been doing uh, in Australia in order to fund sportsmen and women so they could concentrate on their sport. That led to a huge influx of lottery money channeled into the Sports Council uh, with the objective of increasing medal numbers at competitive events. The idea was that by increasing success at the top, one would also encourage participation in at the bottom, and one would begin to have a thriving sporting <coughs> culture in this country, which was in many ways almost on its knees by the middle of the 1990s. I'm not commenting about any individual sport here when I say that. I'm talking about this at a national level in terms of funding and uh, levels of activity and success in international competition. Public money was therefore involved when with the lottery, and recipients were required to have plans so as to be able to show that there would be a safe form of stewardship of the money and, nominally, a return on investment in the sense that the sport would thrive more more medals would emerge, and so on. The Sports Council therefore had to look to national governing bodies in order to find a recipient for the funding. And as you all know, and some of you will have been involved in the process, bids were made and plans were put forward. A whole range of national governing bodies were found not to be properly governed in um, even Victorian terms, I would suggest. A number did not have national boards or committees with mixed skills on them. A number didn't even have bank accounts into which sums of money could be placed and then uh, accounted for. A number did not have finance functions separate from their audit functions. Uh, and even at national levels with competitive sports, there might not be a performance 
coach, there might not be development directors in order to guide the organization as a whole in both of those arenas. Certain national governing bodies were not, in fact, national. We've got representatives here from uh, sports of karate. We've got representatives here from hockey. But and I'm not talking about the current governance when I make the comments I'm about to make, because I was looking back to the year 2000 uh, and sometimes before and shortly after that when I was examining this. But in karate, there were um, different organizations vying to be, be the national governing body. There were different disciplines within the sports, each of which might have its own organization which would represent it and run it. And at times, if you've read the report, you'll see that within, these, within some of these organizations, war would break out. War is not a good recruiting ground for youngsters to come in to sporting and recreational activity. Hockey, and I know we've got representatives <coughs> of hockey here, went bust after the Milton Keynes um, uh, range was um, built. And at one point, money for hockey was put into a private limited company without that company having duties and obligations to the sport as a whole, simply because it provided a useful recipient um, place for the money to go. Boxing, so nobly established in 1880, I'll put the Marquis of Queensbury on one side, uh, had run into significant difficulties. I'll give you a few examples of that. And within the problem areas were ice skating, squash, wrestling, shooting, bowls, UK weightlifting, one time athletics. We could not therefore say that the breakdown in governance in national governing, in, in governing bodies of sports was isolated to a few fringe sports. The scale that I found, and I was very surprised by this, of the lack of conventional forms of good governance was high. Let me just give you a, a couple of examples within boxing. Boxing was set up with the ABA in 1880. It had established a company called ABE Limited. It wasn't clear to me why there should be two organizations dealing with a single sport. But ABE Limited was used through which money was channeled ostensibly for the sport. By 1998, Boxing was in serious financial difficulty. It had a large deficit as a result of running the European Junior Championships. Professional promoters would swoop on amateur boxers with the result that talent was sucked out of amateur boxing and amateur boxing then would have to try to survive without its talented amateurs within its ranks. By the late 1990s, the ABA only recorded at one point 13% of its turnover in its books. Yet, boxing is regarded as not only a noble sport uh, when properly conducted, but as also socially useful and important. Boxing thrives in inner city areas where youngsters who may take a wrong turn can go to the local gym and become talented boxers. There were 6,800 club users uh, for the period I was looking at and 16,000 regular amateur boxers. Other sports, and I'm not going to dwell on them now, had similar sorts of problems. And the amounts of money that were put into these sports over the period that I was looking at were substantial. Boxing, if memory serves me right, it's in the report, was about 6.5 million. Uh, hockey, a similar amount. Karate, 2.2 million. Uh, squash, over 2 million, without the national governing bodies being seen to be in root health. As I progressed into the inquiry, I found that within Sport England itself, things had gone wrong, at least in respect of the World Class Payments Bureau. So we have the funding organization, that I'm about to show you, having problems with its own governance, sending money to organizations which have problems with theirs. This is not a healthy way to conduct national sporting or recreational activities. Within Sport England itself, 
the problems that I encountered were broadly these. Firstly, the World Class Payments Bureau had not been established at board level or approved by the board of Sport England. It was set up with the good intention of getting money into, into sports whose governance arrangements were not good so that individual athletes or teams or clubs could thrive. There wasn't anything nasty or sinister in the setting up of it, but the governance arrangements relating to it were not good. The WCPB was run by the internal audit function within Sport England. And therefore, within internal audit, payments were being authorised by the scrutineer. And internal audit should therefore have been scrutinising payments. But in fact, because these were cases of not, of not fit for purpose governing bodies, the function was given to the audit, internal audit function of Sport England without the penny dropping that by so doing you were in fact breaking a cardinal rule of separating out audit from payment functions. There was a high staff and management turnover within Sport England. As my report records, there were four chairmen in the seven-year period I was looking at and six chief executives. And there had been a policy of the employment of temporary staff. Although there was an internal audit function, the audit committee was not in fact acting as, if you like, a scrutineer of uh, payments. It was reliant on reports to it from the internal audit function, even though there was this breakdown, at least in respect of the World Class Payments Bureau, because you've got an amalgamation of audit and payment within the same unit of the organization. Document management had fallen into disarray. There had been office moves, and when I tried to find documents, I couldn't. Records were missing for chunks of the activities I was looking into. I didn't regard the missing records as sinister. Some may say I was far too trusting, but I, I didn't think this was sinister. Uh, I thought it was simply a case of, because of turnover, that records and the record management wasn't good. Two lessons emerged from that. For good governance, one needs to have the organization which runs the activity in a rude state of governance health. And the funder, in this case Sport England, needed to be likewise. What are the essentials of good governance? As I say, I've, I, I've given you a general definition at the start of this talk. And I note that uh, the, this alliance describes red card to red tape almost wearyingly because when we think of governance, we think of the bureaucracy that surrounds it. We think of the health and safety executive. We think of data protection. You think of VAT and tax issues. You think of criminal records, the CRB, and protection of participants in sport and having to do checks. You think of employment <coughs> law duties, which are statutory and contractual. You think of your duties to the funders. And the whole thing becomes a cloud uh, in the minds of some hanging over the sport. You then think of risks, the risk of being sued by a participant for injury. The risk, for example, in school sports, which has led to schools shutting down all of their sporting facilities in some cases, certainly their outdoor sporting facilities, because of their fear that they're going to be sued. You fear the risk of either committing a breach to staff or being sued by the staff. You fear the risk of being sued, for example, by a participant in a sport, particularly competitive sport, for not being included in a team or for failing a drugs test. And the whole thing can lead to a mindset which leads to the handing over of what one may regard as the bureaucracy surrounding governance to some structure separate from the organization, the sporting structure, in order, as it were, to oversee <coughs> governance, parking it into uh, an, a, an additional bureaucracy within the sport. And it may even lead to a decision, don't do it. I personally think that the decision by schools up and down the country not to take part in competitive sports and keep their playing fields open there may, of course, be cost reasons for it, but I suspect 
but fear of litigation and being sued has led to a wrong turn. But then if you go to the objective of good governance, the objective surely is twofold. First, to ensure that a sport is reasonably safe for its participants, and second, to ensure that the assets and money coming into a sport are responsibly handled. Basically, those are the signs of good governance. If you see it, if you see it operating in the sport, if you see the sport thriving, there is a likelihood that the governance is good. If you go back to my example of the England team this summer, the governance arrangements seem to me to have been good. If you go back to my own sport, sailing, the governance arrangements in sailing, largely voluntary, appear to be well organized, with very little statutory intervention to prevent people uh, taking part in the sport, but still achieving a good safety record overall and high standards with large numbers of gold uh, medals and other medals in international events. So well, robust and well-organized management does translate, I suggest, into success on the field. Each individual team is able to achieve his or her maximum potential. The sport or the activity is available to all who wish to participate, no more than at reasonable cost and with reasonable safety. My headline for this is that you see good governance on the field, on the playing field, in the endeavor itself. Some of you will argue that if you take a, a sport such as football, you may see high standards of play on the field, and you may see a sport which appears to be thriving, certainly economically, at the top end in this country, whilst internationally, if you look at the uh, scandals that have been occurring within FIFA this summer, in fact, there is not necessarily good governance at an international level, you may argue. I would suggest that the, in time, if the breakdown of governance, the suspicion of um, bias and corruption that has infected FIFA this summer, I suggest that if that is not stamped out quickly, it will be seen in the take-up of the sport by potentially thriving sportsmen and women in the future. I do not think that talented young individuals will enter a sport that is in a state of moral chaos. And I also would suggest that, that with, on the playing field itself, we see signs of the breakdown of good governance in the form of uh, uh, behavior which none of us would want our nearest and dearest to indulge in, and we certainly wouldn't permit across the breakfast table. So the signs of good governance, I suggest, are as follows. One, an increased participation in the sport itself. If a sport is governed well, word spreads. You hear that if you go to such and such a squash club, if you go to such and such a football club, the finances are well run, there is a good manager, there is a, a, a good committee, they, they use their resources well, the team does well, people want to join. It is the surest sign uh, that governance arrangements are going well, that people join, they stay, they abide by the rules. You will know that money is safe, and you will know that the safety record is good. It will never be perfect. Within an activities that involve risk, you will never see, despite very good governance arrangements, perfection. Uh, and within uh, sports generally, you will from time to time have serious injuries occurring, which are not the fault of anyone. It is the nature of the endeavor. You will see in good governance an ability to check, if you're a member of an organization or club, the records very quickly. Membership can be checked at the press of a button on a computer or by opening, if not computerized, the pages of a book, and it will be bang up to date. Financial information, similarly, will be up to date and easy to access. And risks will be managed so that in a large sport, there will be somebody responsible for performance, and there will not be somebody else, uh, a mere bureaucrat, responsible for safety on a pitch or as part and parcel of the activity. 
as one tries to get good governance arrangements in place, a resistance can build up. Firstly, to what is perceived to be a bureaucracy. And I suspect everybody here is, uh, wishes to overcome such resistance. But secondly, there's another form of resistance, which is personal. If you have keen enthusiasts running a sport, uh, as, as I came across in karate, people who are dedicated to the sport, there is a sense that grows up around the dedicated individuals. Well, don't do this, because it means we may lose Joe or Fred, who devoted their lives to the sport. That's a misconception. Joe or Fred generally will want to ensure that he or she have got uh, enthusiasts around them and that the mantle, that their mantle can be passed on to a sport that is getting stronger. The danger of dominant individuals within an organization is all too obvious. Firstly, it can give rise to financial risks because too much power is in the hands of one person. But second, one, during the period of that individual's existence, things look good, but when the individual go, goes, things can fall apart. Planning for succession is an essential part of good governance. On paragraph 570 of my report, for those of you who are dying to read it, let me just give you a few of the indications of good governance. This was at an NGB level that would be receipt of funding. First, a board or committee with a mixture of suitable skills for the sport. It's no good having only enthusiasts for the first 11 on the team. You need people who know a little bit about money. You need people who know about the rules, etc. You need a, mixed, a mixture of, of skills and a suitable size with them attending the meetings. Second, you need a sport which has a robust and coherent set of rules. Some of the debates that I came across related to arguments about rules. Uh, within karate, there are different disciplines or art, art forms, and arguments might develop as to one set of rules as against another, or one exposition of the art form as against another. Some of you may recall that language has been the source of wars across the nations and across history since time began. And arguments about rules can be a similar cause for friction. What one needs is a simple, coherent set of rules to govern uh, an activity. And there may be minor variants on it, or there may be divisions which operate in particular different ways. Next, robust financial and, reporting and, and, and accounting procedures. Uh, they need to be well, well managed. If you pick up a decent computer uh, software system, you can have an accounting system for a very modest sum of money. Separation of accounting, uh, of payment from audit functions. It's absolutely critical to any organization that you don't have one person or group of people in charge of both the payment and the uh, auditing of it. Next, some annual audit is usually needed in order for an outsider to check that there has been uh, compliance uh, in accounting terms. And on, in larger sports, someone in charge of performance and someone in charge of development so that you can ensure that the, those who wish to achieve high standards have got the performance directed resource to go to. And at the same time, the sport or activity is developing at a grassroots level. There needs to be sound information and data management. There's no need for anybody to get fussed up about the Data Protection Act. It's something which I come across regularly in my professional life, people saying, if I keep this information, am I in breach of the Data Protection Act? You very rarely are. If you keep data in a secure computer, which gives the names and addresses and the identity of um, your participants, you're not going to be breaching the Data Protection Act. If you keep it in an insecure way, which can be raided by people, then the information commissioner may well be after you. But it's not difficult to secure names, addresses, and contact details of your participants. In sports involving children, one wants to have a child protection policy. And we want diversity. You will need to have a good diversity policy within the sport so that all who wish to participate can, and there is no barrier to entry uh, on grounds of gender or on any other potentially discriminatory grounds. And lastly, 
of course. One would want a decent drugs policy, and in a competitive sport, you're going to have to have a decent drugs testing program. Uh, if all of these are in place, you're going to have a well-run sport. I suggest that English cricket looks as if it had all of these in place, certainly this summer, and the product, I suggest, is that we've had the best team in the world. Failure of good governance uh, leads to at least the following. A perception that this sport is not safe or worth joining, and therefore participation levels will begin to fall. Bias may develop within the organisation, in other words, a preference for a particular aspect over and above other aspects of the um, sport or the activity. Worse still, corruption. Uh, I had suspicions in my own inquiry that there were uh, individuals who might have been uh, obtaining payments in circumstances where they weren't for example, genuinely training. I was not in a position, given the information I had, to prove it. But there was, people would come to me as witnesses saying they had a suspicion that payments had been made uh, in circumstances where they weren't proper payments and they may have been corrupt. And a suspicion of corruption damaging the reputation of a sport or activity is enough to set the rot in. There's a saying around corruption, it only takes one rotten apple and then the barrel becomes corrupt. And if one does corruption cases, uh, as I did as a, a younger barrister, one would see the invidious infection that happened once you had uh, corruption in any single place. Good governance tends to mean that corruption cannot get going. And if, by contrast, you've got a well-governed sport, the sign, as I say, is on the field. The sign is in participation. The, the signs of good governance are in a sport that thrives and grows. I've promised to take uh, questions. I hope that's enough to give you food for thought to ask some. <laughs>